<laughs> and I want a really good person to make an impact. And when we're thinking about it, I could not think of a bigger name than uh, Professor Rajaram. Okay? He is, uh, you know, I would call him the father of computer science in India. Way back in the 60s, uh, he came and really set up it. Before that, he has a thing that when Emperor Haile Selassie came to India, he had the, uh, I think I said the first digital computer in India. Analog. The first analog computer, sometime in the 50s. Okay, and when Emperor Haile Selassie came here, he was brought to Indian science to see that analog computer. So, Professor Radharaman has a history. Uh, in 1982, he came to Indian science to be chair of the Supercomputer Education Research Center. And in 1998, he got the Padma Bhushan. I think the rest the body with that and one of your colleagues. Yes. I think we have, we have some time to kickstart this seminar series. And uh, you all know that today we have an eminent personality among us, uh, Professor P. Raja Raman. So as Professor Prasad introduced, uh, he's the pioneer of computer science in India. So if you see, he's at ISC right now. He's the, he's the professor, honorary professor for supercomputer center and research. And before that, he started a uh, computer science uh, academic in you know, IIT Kanpur. And uh, uh, there he stayed for 20, 25 odd years and uh, uh, established computer science in India. So we can call him as a pioneer of India, for computer science in India. So we have a list of awards. I would like to read out some of them quickly, which, uh, which, which are associated with the prizes which uh, Professor Rajaram has received from Government of India and various institutions. So they are, they are big awards like Shanti Swaru Badnagar, a prize in engineering, then Homi Baba, a prize by UGC, then ISTE Award uh, for Excellence in Teaching, Zaheer Medal for Indian National Science Academy, Lifetime Contribution Award in Engineering by Indian National Academy of Engineering, and last but not the least, Padma Bhushan in the year 1998. He has authored around 20 books and n number of publications in international journals, and around 30, more than 30 doctorates have you know, uh, guided him, uh, uh, Professor Rajana have guided more than 30 doctorates, as well as uh, more than hundreds of masters uh, people, you know, so, uh, to do their masters in ISC and various institutes. So, with this, I'll not deprive you much of the uh, enlightenment from Professor Rajaram, and would like to welcome him on the stage so that you know we can uh, we can learn from his experiences on supercomputers. Professor Rajaram. Thank you. Uh, managers who have uh, worked for, I believe, eight to ten years. After graduation, okay, and um, I'm uh, I was invited by Prasad here to come and give a talk to you, and I thought uh, thought what is a proper topic to talk about, and um, of course today everybody talks about uh, the cloud, computing cloud, so I really want to kind of give you a, a background of how computers and emerging. What are the emerging environments which will be there in the next few years, uh, which you will encounter in your regular work environment. Um, when I started as back in the 50s, uh, computers really occupied huge rooms like this. And um, I never dreamt that one day, you would carry a computer in your pocket. And, uh, and that will, will have mobility, you can get computing power anywhere, anytime you want. So the growth has been phenomenal. No other field of technology has really grown at the same rate as computing. Because there is a saying that if only aerospace industry had grown, the same rate as uh, computing industry, you would uh, be able to go from here to Delhi in one minute and spend, and plane will take one liter of petrol. That's the way it was it is said. But then, of course, you would have to become thumb size to go in those things. So the, the point really is that they are in different types of words. In other words, the physical world. Is, is the world where planes and cars and other things go. And uh, computing is really taking us to a virtual world of a different type. In fact, you can uh, 
you can fly a plane in the virtual world of computing. Okay. That, that's the way in which computing has evolved. And um, the way I organize my talk today is uh, what are the emerging computing environments? We are all used to desktop computers, servers, and so on. But there's, there's a complete change which is taking place. And maybe within the next five years, we'll see a different type of a, an environment in which we'll work. Why are they required? Why is this uh, uh, new environment where they required? And what are the current technology trends which make these environments attractive? And um, features of this new environment. The emerging environments, I would, uh, there are different names people use. I'll explain what they are. One is called grid computing. The other is called cloud computing. And the third is computing utility, which is not yet there, but which I expect to arrive quite uh, the next two or three years, because of the kind of problems one faces with cloud computing today. And um, the common characteristics of all these different environments uh, is that all of these use the internet. Internet has now become ubiquitous. It's there everywhere. And um, all of these use computers which are geographic, geographically distributed. You won't know whether the computer is in Bangalore or whether it's in Timbuktu. It's spread all over the world because it's connected by communication systems. So the physical location of computers are becoming irrelevant. As far as you're concerned, you're looking at a computing power that you want to have for whatever work you want to do. In fact, the machines have become so powerful and so, so much power is being consumed by them because they are so powerful, that apparently many of these companies which are putting these large computing systems put them near power plants to reduce the amount of um, loss in transmission lines. So in fact, uh, they are putting it in places where near hydroelectric dam dams and so on to make the amount of uh, uh, transmission losses minimal, and also to be able to get the amount of power. And uh, the greater problem now in terms of the, 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 the major problem with all these big centers is in terms of heat dissipation. How do you dissipate the heat? You know, yeah. And everybody is talking about green computing and how it can reduce the carbon footprint and all those uh, things which uh, one never thought of when to talk about uh, your pocket computer. Um, why are they required? Uh, if you want to, as a company, if you want to buy computing infrastructure, it is expensive to buy. Install and continuously maintain. Um, what I mean by expensive is, is because the expense is not really the hardware only. The expense comes with the software. Particularly if you have a, if you want to use software like NASTRAN for uh, structural engineering, or CFD, or fluid dynamics, or uh, any, any uh, or, or supply chain management software, or any, any software like for um, doing OR work, linear programming, and many, many of this mathematical software. All of them cost a lot of money. And there are lots of problems in terms of the licensing rules, the how, how you can use them, how much to, how much, how do they charge you for that? How many seats can you have? Very, very complex rules which are there in terms of getting software. Even if you, if you effect, effectively, nobody buys, sells software. They will kind of license you to use the software. So licensing terms and the way in which, uh, uh, how you can be, how it can be used, who <coughs> can use them, and so on, are very complex. And um, the computing which you put, Surveys and so on become rapidly obsolete, and 
of course, organizations have called new machines almost every three to five years. As a, obsolescence is actually built in the system. In fact, it, I think it's a conspiracy between uh, Intel and um, Microsoft. Even Intel comes up with more and more powerful processors, and uh, immediately Microsoft comes up with software which will use up all the all the resources that are there. So you have to come up with a more powerful machine. And uh, the first computer I used uh, had all of 16K memory, 16,000 gigs of memory, and uh, did not have any disk. And we still are able to solve problems in them. And now, now, of course, no, no decent pocket computer will, no, will have 16 k memory. It this kind of, no, your calculator has a lot more. So the, the machines become obsolete for various reasons. Um, strictly speaking, they are not obsolete in the sense that you can still use them. But if you want to increase the memory, or if you want to kind of uh, change some spare part, they are not available. So you really have to dump perfectly good machines. Not because they are useful, but because they are obsolete in terms of the kind of software which you can put on them. And uh, government organizations, or the kind of organizations I work for, have the greatest difficulty getting rid of them. Because you cannot kind of throw them out. You can't kind of tender it. In the early days, of course, we used to get some money for them. Now we have to pay money for guys to take them away from where you are. So the, there's a huge amount of, there's another topic, there's a huge amount of electronic waste which is being accumulated and what to do with them and so on. And um, it's a, not a one time investment, you have to continue to invest. Computing is a means to learn. Installing and maintaining computers is not the core activity of most of them. Computing is essentially something which is an infrastructure you require. Like for instance, uh, Gamma Karnataka has uh, a number of projects, uh, including land revenue project, project for uh, um, the citizen-centric Bangalore one kind of project, and uh, uh, projects of various types. But Gamma is not really in a position to be able to install, maintain, and run machines 24-7. In fact, uh, two years ago, uh, what Karnataka government did was to essentially put their servers in a computing center, which has a room at LED flags. LED provided the entire infrastructure. And they also provided the machines we wanted. So you pay for the essentially infrastructure in terms of air conditioning, power, communications, and all that. And also, the running of the machine. And as far as the government is concerned, they pay for that, and they use the machines. So it's essentially you pay for the use of the machine. Because you are not, it's not your core activity. And similarly, banks, many banks, have large computing facilities, which they, it is not their job to essentially run those systems. And it's better to have somebody else run it for you. Okay. Outsourcing is the name of the game, as you know. Okay. So, uh, <coughs> sophisticated application software is said, expensive and complex, I assume no are there. Very desirable organizations have assured access to whatever they need from a provider and pay only for what they use. So, the trends in technology are interesting because uh, the first one is called the Moore's Law because the uh, engineer uh, Moore predicted when the first microprocessor came that the number of transistors in a microprocessor will double every two years uh, for the foreseeable future. And uh, nobody thought he was correct. They thought this is, uh, you know, take part not as that. And, uh, but it has been found for the last 30 years that it is really true that things are, computing power is doubling every, in fact, it's a two years every 18 months. Only yesterday's paper I saw, the news item saying that uh, one of the, one of the uh, 
patterned engineers who is design, designing machines and designing chips is feeling that uh, Moore's law may end in about one or two years. And he's not sure where they'll continue. But um, there are, it's, a, it's a different kind of path which computing is taking. Um, in, instead of having doubling of pro number of chip processors in the chip, we are essentially going towards parallel over multi-core machines and multiple multi-core machines and so on. So the, the world is becoming parallel in terms of computing power. So the computing speed is doubling, storage size is doubling. Uh, you know, a few years ago, we had a PC of about uh, 20 megabytes of disk or something. In fact, when I first started out uh, in 19, uh, in the bottom of first machine at Kanpur with a disk. In fact, first machine did not have a disk. Second machine which we bought with a disk had uh, two megabytes of disk storage. And the biggest disk we got was 20 megabytes. And today, on a PC, we can get almost a terabyte of uh, uh, storage. 800 GB is pass. So the, the effectively is doubling every whole month or so. And um, the bandwidth, the, the bandwidth being the speed at which you can send bits across in communication lines, is also doubling, almost doubling every nine months. In fact, uh, uh, this, this trend has been fairly recent, primarily because of the coming of mobile systems and newer methods of coding and newer methods of compressing signals. So all these have led to uh, the, the learning of expense for communications. See, who would have thought that uh, BSNL someday would say a STD car it was the same as a local call. And uh, but I remember in 82 when I joined the Institute of Science to get a telephone, I had to pay 8,000 rupees on one, on your, one telephone scheme. And because I was a professor at ISC, I got, I jumped the queue and got the machine, got the telephone after two months or so. So now the situation is completely changed. So everybody now has a phone. And you have not a single person without a mobile phone in his pocket. So the because the cost is coming up and the availability is become possible because of the lowering of cost and technology improvements. This communication is becoming very inexpensive and fast neighbors, the more computer to get accessed as though it is local. Whether it is in as I said where you say are in India, you don't really know where it is. And because communication speed is speed of light. And uh, you are able to kind of sit at your desk, and when you do a Google search, the Google will kind of send your search to any computer which is kind of free. And it may be anywhere in the world. And very often they will kind of find out that send you to the nearest computer if it's possible. It doesn't zero as far as the, uh, as far as your concern, where the machine is uh, So, methods of secure data storage and communications are improved rapidly when using the internet. And that's one of, one of the major issues with most uh, companies and individuals also support about security of our data, about the kind of virus problems, the kind of hacker hacking, and all that issues are always at the back of your mind when you go on communication, on a communication system, particularly wireless communication system. But a lot of encryption methods have come, and um, with the newer encryption methods, we have been uh, standardized, the uh, hacking is becoming a lot more difficult. Wideband wireless communication allow, at a low cost, allows mobile access from anywhere, anytime, an emergence of 3G services. Uh, as of now, now 3G services have come to India. 4G is already there in countries elsewhere. And of course, these are all what I would call sales marketing people's terms. Okay, uh, second generation, third generation, fourth generation, just to make you feel inferior 
if you have a little touch, you know, I am here. In fact, uh, there's of course a uh, joking like thing, but this is, uh, this is a difference. 3D effectively is, is able to give you much higher speed. It will be able to give you a video, video speed. So you can get uh, pictures and, and so on, which you can't on your TV 2 g as kind of system. So the, the newer generated systems use better modulation techniques and better coding techniques and so on, so that you are able to get the same um, system a much better experience on, as a user. Um, remote application software sharing is possible. That is, you know, the application software will be sitting somewhere and uh, several people can be sharing their application software. And uh, voice and video over the internet will allow an expensive access to have some friends at provide services. I think, of course, many of you would have used Skype, which is uh, essentially a um, system over the internet where you can have pictures as well as audio. And uh, I think it goes a free service as well as the consumer, consumer is concerned. And most consumers, especially in India, Grandparents use it to talk to their grandchildren, okay. and and privately because it's it's available, it is uh, not expensive. Okay. So the the possibility of using Skype-like systems for video conferencing over long distances would allow you to have consultancy at a distance in a much more serious way. So let's come to each of these other terms. Grid computing, the definition of grid computing is, is an infrastructure that enables integrated collaborative use of high-end computers, databases, and scientific instruments, owned and managed by multiple autonomous organizations, providing adequate quality of service. What, what do I mean by all this? Uh, the history of the grid is that there are many universities in the world which have fairly large computing facilities. And also there are scientists who work and they would like to collaborate on their research with colleagues elsewhere in the world. They may not have local computing power, but computing power may be available elsewhere. And um, so the scientists got together and said that why don't we collaborate and create a computing grid in the sense that I'll interconnect the computers which are there among cooperating organizations. Like the Institute of Science would have a collaborat collaborating institute, maybe in Germany, maybe in the US. And they'll have scientists who are working together. So they decide to interconnect them through, a, through the internet, but with some kind of security to connection. And um, so they would effectively use machines as a, if I have, if I overflow my machine's capacity, I go to a person whose capacity is not fully utilized. Like for, because of time, time difference, you know, I mean, when we are working at the, during the day, it is night in the US. So their machines may not be as much loaded. So you would be able to use their machines. And when we are sleeping, they can use our machines. And that is one aspect. The other aspect which is more interesting is in terms of sharing of data. There's, there's the um, scientific data, like for instance, the, uh, the way in which they did the gene mapping was in terms of co cooperative work of many scientists from all over the world. And um, similarly, astronomers and so on, where the secrecy is not all that. I mean, it's secrecy in the sense of a um, secrecy in Industrial organization doesn't prevail. It's an open system. So everybody kind of opens up his data, other, other people can look at it, and they also contribute. So that's the way the grid evolved. And while it evolved, that come up with a number of standards in order to be able to interconnect computers with different manufacturers, having different operating systems, and have a uniform access methods regardless of the underlying technology. 
And that led to a consortium called the Globus Consortium. And they came up with a number of software for interconnecting computers and having a uniform environment. And that is essentially what the grid computing uh, came about. This multiple autonomous organization. That's, as far as I'm concerned, I am I am running my own machine. I'm autonomous. And um, I have provided, of course, a certain amount of quality of service. That's, I can't say that the machine is down without some reason. Uh, there should be an agreement in terms of quality of service among these. And that is the beginning. That's about almost about uh, 10 years ago, the grid came to be. Interconnecting computing facilities of corporate institutions form a virtual organization. And optimizing those resources scattered in several similar organizations, allowing access to experimental data stored in various locations. So it's called e science. That's, they are effectively cooperating in terms of the data availability. In fact, one step further, uh, for instance, um, uh, most of the scientific instruments like telescopes and even microscopes and so on. Nowadays, they're all computer control. They all got every, everything has got a microprocessor, whether you like it or not. Uh, your automobile will have probably at least a hour of microprocessors. Okay. And every instrument will have a microprocessor. The washing machine definitely will have one or two. The more the intelligent the washing machine, the more microprocessors they have <laughs> within course. What they mean by intelligent is that it's their program. Okay. They are programmable machines. And that makes it more convenient to use. Now, um, so we have this um, instruments with microprocessors. You can remotely control them. Then I can kind of uh, focus a, 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 a telescope sitting in Bangalore. The telescope may be somewhere in Chicago. I can still be able to kind of control it. Because everything is digital. Digital signals go across the internet and they're able to control it. And I can kind of change the, the way in which the, micros, the telescope is positioned. Similarly, I can also look at instruments and I can control instruments. So this way of being able to control not only uh, numbers in computers, but also be able to change locations of you know, focusing instrument and making instruments work for you, effectively is able to give you a lot more co cooperation in terms of you don't have to own scientific instruments, you can kind of use instruments which is elsewhere, provided the other person is willing to kind of be cooperative and give you access to these instruments. Um, and in grid computing, desktop machines remain as a present. As desktops will be there, desktops are the ones we have used to access, control, and all that. Okay. And uh, no concept of customer provider relationship. And there's no charging policy. It's primarily, uh, as I said, I give something, you give me, give me something else. Okay. Global, as I said, consortium. And they created this. Tools are not open domain. That's important. That the tools for interconnecting computers and making them work uh, cooperatively are in open domain. That is, there is nobody who owns them. Okay. Uh, so source code is available to, for you to kind of do anything you want to do with them. And uh, tools being continuously improved, because they are all done by uh, scientists. There are many companies now got hold of this. They said, it's a very interesting idea. Why don't I sell this idea to companies? Companies, multinationals and others, have uh, many branches spread all over a country, or maybe spread all over the world. Why not kind of get, get them to cooperate in terms of interconnect their machines together and have a single virtual machine available from the point of view of users in the company. So the, whether the machine is in Delhi or in Bombay or elsewhere, it doesn't really matter. So it's, it's we able to use them together. So they, they talked about enterprises. So coming up 
farming virtual computing facility using computing resources, they are a single enterprise. Optimizing user computing resources scattered in several locations. Um, and sharing databases within an enterprise based on need to access rules. Uh, unified threat management is uh, kind of wires and other hackers and so on. Do some firewalling and stuff like that. Have a threat management. And cooperating vendors, evolving standards, allow a right computers to work together. There is a consortium of companies consisting of Sun Microsystems, Oracle, uh, of course the Sun is required by Oracle now, but uh, originally Sun, um, IBM, and um, uh, HP, all of them cooperated together. And that common enemy at that time was Microsoft. They effectively wanted to kind of uh, uh, supersede the Microsoft operating system and try to have a system which uh, is not dependent on Microsoft and work with their own primarily a Unix type environment for the entire um, enterprise grid. And uh, cooperating vendors have all standards and borrowed some of the software and standards from grid computing. And um, no concept of independent provider and managed services. And several customers using it on a pay by use basis. In other words, there's no question of pay by use. Within one organization, they all cooperate and uh, create one environment. The cloud computing is the next evolution, which of course came about in an interesting way. Um, Amazon uh, was, uh, as you know, is a bookseller originally. They on started selling everything, okay. music and whatnot. Okay. And um, for the e-commerce systems they were running, they had to have huge amount of servers, number of servers they had to because they have to always cater to the highest demand. That is, they don't know at a, at a given time how much demand they will have on a server. So they got a plan or plan system for the workspace in it. Suppose 10,000 people simultaneously access. I don't want to lose a customer because he's being cured. So I'd like to be able to have a server large enough to be able to cater to the worst case demand situation. So they put huge servers in many places. Primarily to run their e-commerce business. Then they suddenly found that a whole lot of excess computing power is there, available at non-peak times. They're all going to waste. The best way of using computers is 24-7. You know, they, because the problems with computers come when it's switch off and switch on. So it's better not to switch off. Uh, in fact, when we set up supercomputing center at the Institute of Science, one of the conditions that is put by a supercomputer manufacturer was that you should have additional by seven hours of power and air conditioning and all that. So you should never switch it off. So we have to, in fact, install a generator. In fact, a two megawatt generator. We set up, and uh, we also set up a two megawatt UPS system because generator by itself will not take up the load and the power goes. But they have 20 minutes back. So, room, room full of batteries okay, to be able to run the, run the system. So, the point I'm trying to make is that there's a, this huge computing power, 24 by 7, not used all the times, available. So, they got a, one of the guys got a bright idea. Why not give away computing power to other people? Free of cost, to begin with. Any of it is there, why not do it? In fact, the, other, the, the, the most recent uh, thing which Amazon has done is that uh, anybody wants to have 5 GB for music, you get 5 GB free for a particular music. And you can get music, music from the cloud, as they call it. Music can rain from the cloud. Cloud is running, but the, the infrastructure they have. Okay. And if you buy some songs from them, but every track or two tracks you buy, you will exceed your capacity from 5GB 5 GB to go up to 6GB. If you buy on one, one, one album, 
to buy two albums, it goes up to So the point really is, is one way of kind of giving you freebies. To attract you, you know, give 5 GB. After that, you're stuck. You're doing even more as you buy more from them. So, so they said, then they said that, of course, this is a recent one, but they, instead of giving it free, why not charge? So the next issue, next evolution was to give a, have a charging policy so I can use their servers and pay for it, pay for whatever service I want. Now this um, is extremely interesting and useful for startup companies. If I'm a startup and I got a, a very bright idea, I don't want to invest on servers and computing infrastructure because I don't really know how my demand is going, going to go up. If I, my service is going to be very popular, suddenly I may have to increase my server size, otherwise I lose customers. So I have to have a flexibility in improve, increasing my capacity. And the last is really to either increase or reduce. So they essentially got hold of some of these startups and said, we'll give you computing at a reasonable cost. So you don't have to invest. And you use our, our, our services. And I'll give you a certain amount of guarantees in terms of service level agreements. And uh, see to it that things don't really fail to, to the extent possible. There will always be a spine print at the bottom. Okay. And uh, most people don't care to read that very carefully. Okay. Uh, but still, uh, it, it's, like, it's a good thing for startups because I don't know at the beginning how much uh, I need in terms of computer power. So that is the beginning of the kind of problem. And there are many services. One is just infrastructure as a service. That is just providing computing power. The other is software as a service. Like a company called Salesforce.com came up with a uh, system to aid your Salesforce in terms of reporting back to you and so on. And they have a software which is kind of posted in the cloud. So you can go and get the service and platform as well. So you can have an operating system, a cloud-net kind of platform available on the, on the uh, cloud. So cloud computing primarily is servers being provided by uh, Amazon and so on. Infrastructure maintained by service providers. Access is by using a browser. And using your desktop machine access to using a browser. Services offered are infrastructure and so on. Amazon uh, infrastructure service, quality service, some guarantee on that, and uh, service level agreements. Salesforce.com is as fast. Google also follows so because Google has a uh, huge number of servers for their search, search engines. So they said, why not use it? Okay. Give it to me. And Google also, as you know, Gmail is a software as a, as, as a service. All of us use Gmail. And it's all free of cost. And it's being used from, by them, uh, from their servers. Okay. And uh, of course, the revenue model, uh, all of you know, is advertised. And uh, they're always kind of fine tuning the ads. In other words, they're always eavesdropping on whatever you say in your email. In fact, when I send an email to Amit here, yeah. okay, immediately on the right hand side, I got that somewhere I had mentioned uh, something uh, about cloud or some, something like that. Immediately, it talks about on the right hand side, a whole lot of things about, comes about cloud services, right? Word, and so on, so on, so on, so on. And uh, so, of course, they get money if somebody clicks on that. And as all of you know, there are people in India that they have hired. In fact, my, my housemate's sister was given some money to be able to click. The board. I asked her what she was doing. She said, she said she's clicking. Okay. <laughs> Primarily yesterday on many servers, and these, of course, there are very clever guys who have this business model. That is, they 
employ all these people to kind of sit and stick ads. And they randomize it also. To make sure that you don't really, the person doesn't find out the striking is done by, because first of all, they try to start tricking using automated systems. Okay. And automated systems can be easily detected, detected if somebody is being automated. So they put, of course, the people there. People, they also do some algorithm in terms of randomizing. So the tricking is done in a, in a randomized way so that uh, people don't find out that is, tricking is not by like people who are really interested. Whatever it is, whenever you find a way of doing business, the other people will make different business out of it. Okay. Okay. Uh, so the, the, point, the point I'm trying to make is that the, uh, these large systems, like large companies like Google and Amazon started this. Many organizations have entered this talk. Immediately, of course, Microsoft saw the threat immediately. The threat is that desktop is going to vanish. Because the reason why desktop is going to vanish is one would like to have mobility. One would like to carry his computing anywhere he wants, any, anywhere, anytime. So with the wireless coming and with tablets, things like iPad and so on coming, computing is at your fingertips anywhere you go. Okay. And desktop is all said and done. That is a problem in terms of the operating system being upgraded every time and obsolescence sitting in and desktops, of course they are making they may make money on their operating operating systems in spite of the operating systems not being all that good. Okay. And uh, a new version comes which just fixes the bugs of the old system and uh, and they are not done done anything new to it. Right? And they are becoming bulkier and bulkier and bulkier. And nobody really knows all the features that are there. In fact, word processor features, I don't think anybody uses all the features. There's no need to. And uh, so, but anyhow, if I got 100 features, I'm better off than somebody who's got 80 features. Okay. Nobody asks which features I'm going to use. So the, the point really is that the desktop as a, as a device is uh, going to kind of see its end in a few years, at least to pay me to stretch from the five years. But it's going to go off slowly. Already people are kind of replacing the rest of with laptops and tablets and so on. So Microsoft saw the threat, and of course they also started their own cloud business now, called Azure, which you can use uh, uh, servers. They're not bringing the servers, but they're buying servers. Now. And of course IBM, uh, I not put IBM in this, but IBM has always been in this, uh, in, the, in the hardware area. They sold off their PC a few years ago, but they are in server, server business in a big way. Uh, they are, they are in, um, the early, you know, the early business models of IBM was extremely good to such time that the American antitrust and it has caught up with them. The early business model, when they had about 95% of the market, was that they never sold a computer. They only rented computers. Then you, you, you don't buy a machine from IBM, you rent it. And when you rent it, you don't get a machine. You get people along with the machine. That's in the, in the 70s and 80s. There will be a friendly, system engineer who will come along with the machine. Then we have a friendly customer engineer, of course. Customer engineer's main business was to maintain the computer. So there will be a customer engineer and a service engineer and a system engineer. They will come along with the machine. They will kind of improve your software, uh, hold your hands, and in fact that in the 70s and 80s, many people did not know how to use computers effectively. The system engineer essentially told them what systems to put on, this, on the machine and so on. And um, it's not altruistic. System engineer knew more about business, so. And then they asked him, they gave, and told them many reasons why they should upgrade their machine. Go from 360 model 40 to 360 model 60 or whatever it is. And that way the, the rental went up. 
and they always recovered the cost of the machine in about five years. At the end of five years, after five years, the it's all jam, okay. a jam on the toast. So they got the toast in the five years. So that is their business model. And when the machine became obsolete in the USA, like IBM, Korean and so on, they shipped them out to India, painted them, and reset. They didn't even reset the clock. But uh, in the meetings in the early days, I told them, you guys are so lazy, they don't, they don't even reset your uh, clock there. And what is it? Not clock, to the, the, the meter, which says how many hours the machine has been used. It is like the motor cars, you know, speed, speed, you know, the mileage my, my, my indicator. And so they don't even reset that, and you, lose, you give it to people. Okay. And of course, the result of that was that they reset it afterwards. <laughs> they reset it back to zero before they gave, they gave it to the customer. But the point is that they had a very good thing going for a number of years, till the antitrust caught up with them. The other companies tried to follow, saying that this huge company is undercutting us by giving this free, so-called free system engineers and free maintenance and so on. And uh, that's why we are kind of not able to compete with them. So when once they, they, had, they were forced by the US antitrust to separately price each service. Once they had to separately price each service, then of course they their down pass chart in terms of the uh, uh, they are not anymore in the eighty five percent, ninety percent market type player. And um, as I said, the PC business is another big story. And we I don't know whether I have time in any case. That's an interesting story because for, for many of you to be uh, for business people it's been an interesting story. Um, the IBM was the first company to come up with an idea of a PC. Even now, the machine that you buy is called IBM PC, even though it's not IBM. It's a, uh, so they, they came up with the idea of a desktop computer. Back in 1982, uh, uh, around 82. Okay. Till then, they're all mainframes and so on. So when they came up with that desktop computer, and a cell group, and they went to first start computer. They wanted to tell, uh, tell the management that now there's, there's a new technology I've got. It's got a huge potential. I'd like to be able to market this. Now, IBM is a huge organization. It's very difficult to move an elephant. And there are a lot of hierarchy and so on. And so they said, this is not a computer. There's something which is like a typewriter. They had an electric typewriter division. It's the main so, so called IBM's electric, it's electric typewriters. So electric typewriter is a ball which used to kind of move, rotate and type on the, uh, on the paper. It's a very interesting technology. And uh, so they said, this is like a typewriter, so I put this IBM PC in the office machines division. So it went to the office machines division and not the computer division. When it went to the office machine division, division the office machine division paper knew how to sell typewriters. They knew all about uh, that area. But they are complete novices in software. They don't know much about software. And the mainframe guys, they said there's too small a machine for me to bother with the software. So they gave the software, they outsourced the software to Bill Gates. And uh, they also made the architecture of the machine open, available to them. So once, this is the biggest mistake they made. Okay. And uh, Microsoft became much bigger than I did. So the biggest mistake, because Bill Gates is really clever. When he took this job of creating the desk operating system for that IBM PC, he said he should be free to sell it to anybody. That it is not proprietary only to IBM. So when people came up with the IBM Pro, they had a ready-made operating system. They could buy it from Microsoft. 
So could I be able to try to catch up with that OS too? And then we stood it. And then we stood it. And that's, in other words, one or two years is the eternity in the building process. So if you are behind by one or two years, you are gone. So that's the kind of the, the interesting, the marvelous story, effectively, is that uh, when you don't, when a new technology comes and you don't know too much about it, I think God kind of asks the right people about what to do with it. And they put it in the, in the wrong, wrong way. Because when systems, companies become too large, they also have this problem of not being able to carry it. Now, also interestingly, the, the thing was driven by the salesperson also, marketing guys, when they go and sell a mainframe, this commission they get is a percentage of the cost, or whatever rent or whatever they get. A PC is pretty little amount. So that commission is so low. I have to sell thousands of them to come up with a money equivalent to selling one or two of the machines. So they are not interested. The marketing guys also played a part in saying that the machine is not going to be completely different. But right to the office machines. Because office machine marketing people are selling many typewriters. And there's another typewriter. So, so many people have gotten to be in cloud computing business. Um, we have other cloud services like Joe's Street, Free the Cloud. Amazon is free service, as I told you. Video streaming, and in fact, the Netflix is a um, company selling movies. Now they're all hosted on uh, in the cloud because they don't, uh, you know, they don't want to keep a huge amount of thread for video on demand. Video on demand. It's available in the cloud. Video on demand service, digital library in the cloud. So uh, you can put everything in the cloud. So if you have a, an interesting idea, um, in fact, I, I believe that they may put Aadhaar on the cloud. Because as long as uh, uh, a system is not, you know, Aadhaar is an open system. So it doesn't matter where it is. And uh, so it's a convenient platform for startups. Connection to the cloud. Major problems that come. In fact, two days ago, you might have seen in the papers that Amazon had a great problem where somehow their services failed for a few, uh, for a few hours. And the companies can't put up a few hours of failure. So, one of the major problems is connection with them. If there is a connection failure, and one of the major difficulties are desirable to have redundant connections, failure of servers of a cloud provider, no standardization, there are danger of getting bound to provide. So here's a kind of a public, uh, public cloud, whether it's publicly available, and you get caught with Amazon, they'll have their own methods of getting into it, getting out of it, and so on. Go to Azure cloud, there are different protocols, and so on. So you can't easily shift. If you don't like services provided by Amazon, you can't shift your system to Azure. Okay. Because the protocols are different, the systems are different. There's no standardization. Security worries in the public cloud. And nobody wants his data in the public cloud where the competitor can get, get out of it some, on one way or other. So there's a need for a next evolution in the, in the cloud system. So that is where I, that next evolution is what I call a computer utility. Computer utility is resources consist of computer servers, storage servers, application servers, maintained by several cooperating service providers. The point I'm trying to make is that it's not a single Amazon or a single Google, but they all are supposed to cooperate. Okay. So as far as the user is concerned, the way I look at it is that the user goes to a broker and not to a particular service provider. The broker goes to a resource manager who has, in his view, all the resources available from all the cloud, cloud providers. And 
the resource, looking at the resource manager, the broker decides which is the best service to go to for the cost constraint and time constraint given by the user. The user can ask for either a fast service or it doesn't matter, it doesn't matter how long it takes. And uh, I'll, I'll, I want to have a recommending job which can go on for some time. I don't want to be a response. So the, the resource, resource uh, cost, cost is there. And based on that, the uh, broker gives a facility. Network to get it made accessible to customers by providers. Customers deal with single unified provider to brokers. Provider assures security of customers' data and systems. In other words, there's a security systems are well made, established to be able to kind of make sure that everything is encrypted, everything is encrypted with the highest possible encryption, and uh, firewalls are maintained and so on. So, um, However, assures disaster recovery, and if needed, this is trust community. In other words, uh, you you have a there's a disaster some because of earthquake or something somewhere. Immediately things get shifted, and uh, you can have mirrored service. There's two things can be going on simultaneously. You have two different providers. In other words, the, the one provider fails, and get the service from the other provider. So I'm not stuck with Amazon only. I can have a different provider. And the uh, provider is consulting on use of specialized software and demand. In other words, more interesting thing is that apart from the infrastructure, I also provide consultancy services on the internet, on the web, through video conferencing. Particularly, the greatest problem people face in using large computing systems for intricate problems is in terms of the software. If you've got mass time you're running, and you get into a problem, then you have to have an expert to guide you how to get out of that problem. And um, these softwares, they always they go on upgrading and come up with the next version of it. It's an improvement to the older version. There's always an in-house expert who tells you how to use the new software and how to kind of get the best out of the uh, out of the system they provide. So provider get consulting for use. And available to customers when and where he needs it, and use and pay for actual services. So you get not only computing, but you get consulting, you get software, software consulting, and maybe other consulting also, along with that. Consulting, to use the computing facility appropriately. So you're doing a data mining job, for instance. They'll come up with the best, they'll tell you the best mining algorithm, best algorithms to use for your particular type of uh, situation that you want to use. So, the utility is something which is not utility like electrical utility. Electrical utility is just when I plug and I get my power. This utility is significantly different. It's not just a providing computing power. It's providing computing power along with the consulting on how to use the computing power effectively with appropriate software. So this is the kind of evolution <coughs> which I foresee. And uh, the parts are client access machines. Client access machines are not going to be any more desktops. They will be primarily like something similar to IAT. Yeah, I have an access machine which is on which I can essentially do video conferencing. It will provide anywhere, any, any, any time use. And it will be effectively a 3G or 4G type of connection. The broker, the broker system will be in turn, in turn, connected to other resource manager and so on. Uh, broker machines accept the request. Resource manager has information available about resources, schedules jobs, access control and threat management is provided, and the physical resources, infrastructure, compute server, help desk, application servers, and storage servers. All these together makes up the utility. So effectively, the Block diagram is something like this. At the bottom are the, are the user layer, the user, user access machines. The next layer is the brokers, to whom you go. And then the resource manager, access control, 
and rate management and the physical resources connected along with the aid. And then you got application servers and this and so on. So this entire thing really becomes the computing thing. Where is the consultant here? Uh, that we help this. Application servers and help, help this. And here we connect it to the infrastructure and you can, the user can ask for this. Yeah. In that time you are assuming the protocol is single, uh, just one single protocol. Yeah. One common protocol to get to the browser. Like currently you got... Uh, the service providers... Pardon? So there should be standardization between service providers. There should be a yeah, cooperation among service providers. Make sure, like you know, internet became what it is today. Because of TCP IP, being standardized, they are already using it. Um, the, the, see, now the, the experience of Amazon few days ago, when the service went down, will get them to kind of open their eyes. Everybody will see, see to it that cooperation is much better than having complete competition. So there will be some, you know, because ultimately, by cooperation, everybody is going to gain. It's a win-win situation. And, and that and is my prediction. <laughs> I, I feel that internet became what it is today because of the fact that the individual companies we are providing networks and so on, they all jettisoned and jumped on the TCP IP protocol because it is for a mutual good. And the enterprise led idea came because of the cooperation of multiple hardware providers. They all jettison their own systems and assume and came up with a, a, a common uh, robust uh, type, robust based system for it. There is, you know, the, the guarantees in terms of the kind of encryption they use and, and the, the contract which is signed between the brokers and the, and the, uh, the customers. And uh, there will be some penalty classes of, of various types. And uh, you are right, there is always this, this little worry among people that I would have, you know, how, just like, you know, for instance, today, you uh, go to the internet and you do banking on the internet. Okay? You can lose money. So somebody can hand in and get your password and uh, take money from you, from your account. Okay? But to a major extent, you are protected by multiple passwords, pins and so on. And similarly, there will be multiple methods of uh, access, control, and uh, in fact, encryption algorithms will become, become fairly good. Uh, the advanced encryption standard, the two to six bit encryption, is going to be fairly difficult to break. So all your data which is stored. Today, many companies store their data in their database without encryption. Incidentally. And some disgruntled employee can get the thing away from you. Uh, whereas, if you go to a system like this, you are forced to encrypt everything which is stored. To some extent, it is a lot more secure here. Then, the, but the idea that you are secure because you have in your, in your building. In your building, the person who is going to leak, the person who is going to leak your data is somebody internal. After all, WikiLeaks came out because of the internal person, not because somebody from outside acted and got this thing away from you. So the point is, this idea of security is partly mental. So it's a question of I think we have a professional security provider providing security in terms of encryption and guarantee is there. I think I would rather trust, trust him. And then there, there can be first business contracts and, and the legal people get, get into it and take forever to write up the contract. Okay. That's a different issue. There so are lots of uh, research areas and lots of problems. Uh, uh, refining the layer architecture, user client machine architecture. I got some idea on that which uh, some, some students will work on. Uh, there, precisely, security issues, simulated architecture, service pricing models, and business models. How this entire thing is going to be uh, worked with business.
to conclude, lowering cost of communication to not with increasing bandwidth and mobility has changed computing scenario completely. So the scenario is changing mainly because of the communication being much cheaper and much easier, way, much more easily. Way. Organizations, organizations are trying to have to maintain an upgrade costly infrastructure and look forward to outsourcing installation, maintenance, and updating services to service provider. <laughs> Provided you can, you know, security can be guaranteed and business continuity is actionable. These are important. And uh, desktop machines of the virtual variety as outlook is no smoothness and uh, need inexpensive access devices with excellent graphical user interface as replacement. Transition period will be there. And desktop will not vary overnight, which will, but slowly things are going to change. Pay for use computing is a need of the hour. So you are essentially going to end up with a, with a system this time. It is not as though the, this idea is very new. In fact, when the first time sharing operating system, then the first so-called compatible time sharing system was designed back in 1966 uh, by a person called Fernando Corbato at MIT. He had uh, predicted that someday you will get a utility. That is, you, you, are, you ought to get uh, a computing just like a power utility. Computing as on tap. But my, my point is that power utility is very different from computing utility. Computing has a requirement of not only the infrastructure, but lots of applicating software and also people to help you to use applicating software effectively. So that will become feasible because of the high bandwidth available and video really conferencing and other facilities which have come available. And um, with the cloud is already there and cooperating clouds will end up in a new environment. With that I will stop. Any questions you may have on this topic or something else? Maybe I'll try. Uh, so, you spoke about the security. Yeah. Actually, I was also what happens if they sell this data to advertisers and they misuse it by calling us or spamming? How about that? Everything is in one place. How can that be? No, already that is enough. They are all your mail. And this is Gmail. And they are, in fact, bombarding with, with apps. Okay? So you are, you are getting something free, then quotes. But you are paying it some other way. Whereas these services will pay services. Once you get to pay services, you can also insist on certain minimal service level guarantees and certain minimal uh, requirements of not using, you know, uh, of guaranteeing, guaranteeing security of your software, of your uh, data and all that. So you can ask for that okay, as part of, uh, uh, and that the thing will evolve. There's, there's always a sphere. Fear is always there. In fact, the, uh, currently, see, the, the greatest um, um, enemies of this kind of computing are the CIOs of organizations. The chief information officer of an organization is going to lose his importance because the computers are going to be taken away from him and it's going to go somewhere else. But CIO's job is going to change. It will not be anymore the running the computing, computer infrastructure. But negotiating the best kind of um, service I can get and also ensuring that the quality of service I get is good and telling the users how best to use these services for improving the working with organization. Yeah. Sir, uh, can you comment on where does the IT industry or the Oh, see, the IT industry, interestingly, it is an industry where innovation 
and new ideas are the ones which are going to drive it. And innovative ideas are changing rapidly over the years. In fact, only two days ago, I read in the recent Economist a very interesting kind of small item about uh, advertising. You know, there are advertising boards which are there in the airports, which are all you know, electronic, not part of paper, which is which are stuck. And they go on down, go on changing. And the, you know, the idea which they have is they put a little camera on that. So a guy comes along and the camera looks at him. And if he is looking very worried and so on, when he crosses that, that is what uh, insurance. <laughs> he's very bright and he is, uh, looks happy and all that. That is about a movie. Okay. So the point I'm trying to make is that the innovation, the, the possibility of these kinds of things, because the technology is there. Camera can put anywhere. Okay. And camera can look at you. And the software, which are now so good that um, the software becomes good because the hardware has the, the amount of, amount of software, memory you have is almost unlimited. So you can write very, very complicated software. So the software you have is, um, can be very innovative. So I gave a very simple example of uh, the fact that this simple innovation, they say that in a, in a, in a few years' time, because it's very, very dangerous to put these devices on roadsides. Okay, uh, you can't put it in a private property. Okay. Uh, so maybe billboards on private properties will change. Of course, the somebody may throw a stone. There's a problem. See, to those things. But within environments like the airport and so on, it will work very well. And uh, you may have seen the the new IBM machine, uh, not the blue gene, but something similar to that which is able to kind of beat a human person on a game, on a, on a game where common sense is required. See, the important point there is not that it is a, a playing chess is very, very different from answering questions in a quiz. Answering questions in a quiz requires a wide breadth of knowledge. Also, it requires a lot of common sense. And that people thought was never possible, you know, it's never possible to put common sense into computers. It's very difficult to put common sense to be close. <laughs> okay. So, so the, the, the problem is that they, now, to that extent, the interesting point about that machine is that they have been able to kind of codify the day to day knowledge of people and common sense and putting the machine into a proper search. Searching has become impossible because of speed. Okay. So, whereas chess playing program is impressive, these are something which is one, one step ahead. Yeah. Uh, just one more thing on DNA computer. Will it be of concern? I don't know enough about DNA to be able to answer that question. But I would not be surprised if uh, that becomes a, a not, maybe not in the right Maybe 20, 20 years from now, they may become. Uh, the, the problem is one of uh, the fact that. Uh, you have to kind of have an environment in terms of the, uh, like for instance, uh, the, the way in which chemically things behave are very, very fuzzy compared to the way in which hard systems like to behave. So uh, I, this progress is very, very slow. People have been talking about this for many years, but progress has been very slow. And there's no breakthrough as of now. Uh, but uh, I, I'm always, you know, optimistic. So maybe 20 years from now, things will be like that. Yeah. Uh, you talked about the future of computing for India, but this is only limited to a very small percentage of Indian population. Right. What do you think is the bottleneck in getting this to the masses from India? Getting the, getting computing, and primarily the, the questions are on, of language. Okay. Uh, language is a major issue. And we are not had, we are not been able to solve that language issue in a in a any satisfactory way. Um, in fact, it's after so many years of research, even today, a good OCR software for Indian languages is not available. Okay. OCR software for uh, English and so on 
it g gives you almost 90, 99% accuracy. Whereas uh, because of fonts, they lose standardization. Even in terms of the standardization of uh, the uh, codi codification for languages, there have been continuous struggles put in paper between states and centers and so on. So there's a, the problem is one of language. One, one is that. But you can see that one thing, Luther finds that technology is a useful. He was start using it. Like mobile. Mobiles don't require electricity. And something which is found useful. And the um, return on the investment is considered quite appropriate for everybody. So people are willing to invest. <coughs> so the, the computing also will become like mobile. In fact, you know, mobile already has computing in it. So the question is, the price comes down, and you find some actual uses which are effective, uh, then maybe uh, it will go and spread to the masses in a big way. In fact, the, the hope of uh, Adam is that once you have a, a number, you have access and so on, you will you'll have a, a proliferation of a different type. Okay. And as of now, the uh, language literacy issue is one of the issues. And the, the people don't really see the value for their investment. Of course, the uh, various access systems are there for government services. They are working reasonably well. Okay. Uh, not perfectly, but reasonably well. And um, similar to Bangalore 1, they have got systems in uh, every taluka in Karnataka. Almost all over India they are coming. I think the, bed, the biggest expense in the next few years in India, in ID, is going to be government. E governance projects are going to come in a big way. And uh, so huge amount of investments are going to come from government. And many companies are previously unwilling to go to government because of the fear of something like state of OK. Uh, maybe with the, with the um, new kind of movement towards non-corruption, things may change. I do hope that uh, uh, they will change. Because uh, there's a very interesting book uh, which has been edited by Subhash Bhatnagar of uh, I Am Amba. Um, he uh, looked at various e-governance projects in various states. One of the proposed, one of the um, uh, allowed um, aims or goals of e-governance projects was to uh, reduce corruption. But uh, after this, uh, what, what he found at the end of it was that what has happened is that service is improved. But corruption is not done. But the amount of money you give has gone down, and you have guaranteed service for the money you pay. So to that extent, uh, IT has, has influenced or made the made government better. But if you think that suddenly, like a magic, magic wand, IT will reduce corruption, uh, it's not true. Like private reservation system, people thought that uh, computer reservation will completely put all the brokers out of business. But we are doing everything. Yeah. So, I think the supercomputer that you have done. Well, I mean, uh, the biggest and fastest supercomputer is now in China. When uh, I visited China in 1996, there is not a single large computer. And uh, uh, there is hardly any. There is, there is, the computer which we had in the of Science was an order of magnitude better than the best machine they had in their university. But today, they are the fastest machine in the world. Okay. So supercomputing, of course, is, is a niche area. Okay. And uh, of course, all supercomputing is going bad. All machine learning. And uh, in India, for the first time, they have a Tata's uh, built their own supercomputers. And they built their supercomputer in exactly 18 months. So building a supercomputer is no more a uh, uh, high technology job. Because you put together a huge number of servers and have a reasonably complicated system, and a lot of software is available in the way. So supercomputing is, um, uh, is improving all the time, 
and it's becoming accessible and with utilities and so on, they will be all in the cloud also available and the grid is already available. So I don't think the, the, the point is I try to make is that the uh, uses of computers originally was thought of primarily in scientific computing. Now it has changed. Uh, it's gone into animation, uh, production movies, in uh, business in terms of uh, derivatives and all the other uh, you know prediction methods and so on, which requires huge amount of computing. So supercomputing is uh, it's very difficult to define supercomputing. It's high performance computing, and at any, any given time, you get a huge amount of teraflops of computing power. And there's no more magic. You know, what, what I can say is, any a supercomputer is no more magic. It's a question of amount of money you are willing to put, amount of, uh, uh, what, what should I say, the willingness on the part of the government to sink in that money, and the amount of power that you're willing to put. So this huge supercomputer in China apparently consumes so much power that they have to put it, you know, gigawatts of power. Yeah. Sir, so, uh, my question is uh, on the mobile. And uh, as you mentioned, we have about 700 million people. Yeah, right. So how do you see the future I mean, in terms of using that as a strength in terms of taking the next phase? In fact, you know, already it's happening is, you know, like, you know, the question of cost versus the uh, perceptual use. If you perceive that by paying, say, 5,000 rupees and 1,000 rupees, you get something which is much better than by paying 1,000 rupees, you would invest that money. Okay. So the seems to me that if you get a, a iPad type thing, and you can use it for, for multiple purposes, like uh, you know, downloading music, downloading movies, downloading books, and all, all available any time you want, and most of them almost free, then you would buy it. Okay? And of course, the, the money will be recovered for the communication cost. So, my question is so that is basically the same people who are using the web as well. But there are 600, 600 million other people who don't understand the language of that. So, what kind of. They all go mobile. Okay. They all go mobile. And uh, hopefully, a lot of icon-based systems will come, which are completely language independent. So you just have icons, and you have to test budget, uh, tax budget, and the, the tax, you know, the, it will give you different applications. Like you want to quickly calculate interest on your loan, you just touch that, and maybe it gives you the interest in the loan. But it, it gives you in, in audio, not really. Okay, so it, uh, speech, you know, the, the SMS to speech systems are easy to implement. Okay, so people who are literate is going to become speech based and mobile based. Question. Yes. My question is that uh, uh, the first generation of the Not only security, it's also a place of losing the service. Exactly. Because you know, if I get cut off, right. so where am I? In your opinion, so what, going forward, what should the ISP be doing to elevate those risks and to increase the uh, yeah, the, the ISP or broker is uh, to give a guarantee. The, bro the, the agreement will be to put in the broker and the customer, and not put in the cloud provider and the customer. Okay, so I sign with a broker on, on a service level agreement and on terms of security. And uh, I only deal with him. And he deals with the other day, that's the thing. That's the way the business model ought to work. Two more questions? Two more. <laughs> I'll take you as a random advocate. Yeah. Okay. So, Two more. Moose law is going to become a limit at the quantum level. It's going to end up yeah. sometime yeah. at this time. Yeah. So, like, what is your prediction about quantum computing for the future? See, the problem with the quantum computing as of today is that <coughs> you have to have the whole thing works at, at a very low temperature. So, 
So in order to be able to use a machine effectively, you want to immerse the entire computer in liquid nitrogen bottle. And uh, to, if you immerse something, something on liquid nitrogen bar, <coughs> there's any problem, you can't take it out of that bath because it will, it will become brittle. So you got to take six hours for it to kind of warm up to room temperature before you can do any repair. So the problems are, in, uh, and also as a, as a computing center, do I run a computer or do I run a liquid nitrogen plant to have a different? So these are the issues which are, built, are really the ones which are uh, reducing the amount of work. The commercial quantum computing will come only for very special purposes, particularly security and so on. I don't see it coming in any big way in the uh, near future. Last year, last year, last year, last year. Sir, how do you see IT in India in terms of what future goals? <coughs> well, um, IT and what, what's, what I mean, kind of IT? We have been competitors, right? Emerging market knowledge, emerging economies, we are prominent in countries. And we are fast losing our language at one place. What is future goals? Future goals in terms of new ideas you have to get. Okay. And all said and done, um, in a democracy, with a certain amount of no, the, 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 the difference between the way in which we work and the way in which people work in a non democratic environment is that we shoot our mouth off all the time. And we, we do a lot of uh, maybe uh, disagreements which are very good for innovation. Whereas uh, there is more regimentation in that country. So in the long run, I believe that innovation will come out of free environment rather than regimented environment. So, uh, so, so I am optimistic. I am optimistic. Um, but there's a difference. There's also a problem. Somebody said that uh, the problem with India is that each vector is very good, but all the vectors point in different directions. The vector sum is zero. So that also can be another problem. In other words, the, the fact that you dis disagree, if you don't come to a consensus, it can lead to destruction. But as an environment where it is more disciplined. They may not be limited, but they may go in a in a direction which may be the wrong direction. But they will go. Okay. Whereas we may not we may be static and not decide which direction to go. So that is a danger. So there is both opportunities and challenges. And my own optimistic feeling is that I think we have enough innovative people. But the Chinese work harder. <laughs> As you use Chinese students, I understand. They work on time. Thank you very much, sir. Technology is soon going to become a commodity, and that's where your management guys come in. We talk about being broker, the help desk, etc., etc. That's where they all come in. Okay. There are two kinds of people who come to IIM. The first person gains by coming to IIM and they'll put on their guitar, I went and gave a speech in IIM. The second person, IIM gains by them coming over here. Not only that, repeatedly people say, I expected to see this kind of a person in IIM. I expected to see that kind of a person. Professor Raja Raman falls in the second category. Okay, where we gain by getting him. And he's a legend in his lifetime. And I really want to thank you, sir, for taking the time. I will talk now, I will this to you. enough answers to uh, questions so that we can work on some very good projects uh, a few months down the road when we talk about what it takes to uh, have a capstone for it. So thank you very much. Sir.